Cameron Jack. Hey, Cameron, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. It's great to see you. It really is. Yeah. I, I appreciate you being on my live stream. This is the first time you've been on my live stream. I appreciate yeah. you stopping in with us. Well, I appreciate the invite. I always kind of, I always joke that I see you everywhere. Um, you know, it's like for some reason we kind of got on, I think a, a similar speaking circuit for a while. And so, but then I went like six months without seeing you and I was, I was having withdrawals. So I, I know. You. Yeah. Um, I thought I, I needed yeah. my burns time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was interesting because, you know, we, we kid each other when we say, you know, people ask us, are you going to go speak? We always say, well, is, is Cameron going to be there? Cause if he's <laughs> coming, I'll go speak, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we have spent a lot of time together. It was good seeing you down at the uh, honeybee expo and had yeah. dinner one night together. So that was a lot of yep. fun. Yeah, yeah. I like that fan, but in the background, the fan is just positioned perfectly to give you some horns. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm gonna head. try to get it there. There you go. <laughs> the first time I met <laughs> you a couple of years ago, we were actually speaking uh, at the Maryland State Conference uh, over there. That's Remember right. that? We went out and had crabs one night. Yep, we did, um, and that was really great. The bee the beekeepers there were so wonderful, but it was. If I'm not mistaken, you you might correct me. I think it was in 21, 20 or as maybe early 22. So because we were still, it was still like in that time coming out of COVID, and and so it was uh, kind of a hybrid meeting. But that was it was the first time in a while that I had done something in person. So that was oh okay yeah yeah that was, that yeah. Was good. Yeah, it, it was pretty close to COVID because I know that they had some people that were there, like you said, a hybrid. Some people were there and then some, I think a lot of them were um, Zooming in or something. So the audience was a little bit different. So yeah, it was fun. It was fun getting to talk with you. And uh, yeah, so uh, good to have you tonight. And you know, um, wow, you you are, you are quite the bee scientist. I always enjoy <laughs> talking with you and asking you questions and just hanging out with you. I, I enjoy that you are very practical and you can you can really um, relate the, the science in a real understandable term. So I really appreciate you a lot. And of course, you're working at the university there closely with Dr. Jamie Ellis. And yeah, that's right. you guys have a fantastic B team, B lab, everything. Wow. Making some making some good headways in, in B science, aren't you? Well, we you know. I'll say we're we're very strategic. Um, we want to provide helpful research, helpful extension, like like videos and and like publications, and and then we are also trying really strategically to create educational programs for like students and for for yeah. beekeepers. And so, I think what's been really great is um i'll give i'll give jamie most the credit here almost all the credit he's <laughs> he's 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 ve definitely a great visionary guy and and he so he's he kind of had this program in his mind and then so then i was able to get hired back in 2018 to just create this beekeeping education program a few years later amy vu who i don't know if you've ever met her before david um she's fantastic and she yeah. is just uh, such a great, um, great communicator and like so good at connecting people. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so she's helped us make a lot of inroads with commercial beekeepers throughout uh, Florida, but not just Florida, kind of throughout the country. Cause she, she's just, um, yeah, just really good at bringing people together and, and communicating science. So we kind of got those, there's three of us that are all yeah. faculty at the university of Florida, which is, which is rare, I think, in the United States to have multiple honeybee-focused faculty kind of working together. Well, We're all in yeah, the same yeah. building. You know, we go yeah. eat lunch together every – we we have a little lunch room in our building. So we can just sit there and, and talk and bounce ideas off with, yeah. with a great crew of people. And so it's mm – -hmm. um, I kind of joke with people. There's, there's a lot of places I'd probably – rather live i saw somebody you go to us from central florida or central utah it's close to my home like there's some places i would rather live but i i i have a hard time thinking of any where i'd rather work i mean it's just yeah. good people um really great facilities come come check us out sometime yeah that's 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 really great and uh so how long have you uh, been there at the university of florida I came to Florida in 2015. Um, 
Oh, wow. Long time. Yeah, I, yeah. As you know, because we've spoke in Nevada together. Um, I'm originally from Nevada, uh, Southern Nevada. And then I went and did my, I did my undergrad at uh, Cedar City, Utah and at Southern Utah University. Go T-Birds. And it's just a small <laughs> liberal arts school. And um, then we went, or after uh, I graduated, I went to, and did my master's research at Oregon State University. So go Beavs. And then um, I was studied, there is when I first started doing honeybee research. And I did mm -hmm. work kind of related to honeybee gut pathogen, Nozema serrana. And then from there, um, I went to Florida in 2015 to do my PhD with okay. Jamie. And yeah, then great. really fortunate to get that faculty job. I was still a PhD student at the time um, when that job position came open, but I applied for it and got it and then had the miserable task of trying to finish, uh, you know, finish my PhD while I was also working full time, which was tricky. But yeah, anyways, yeah. so I've been in Florida for almost almost a decade now. Yeah, well, years. good. That's pretty yeah. cool. Wow. So uh, what kind of secrets can you tell us about Jamie Ellis that nobody knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you a few secrets that I don't think he would mind me sharing too much. One, the man does a killer golem impression. So oh. if you ever, you know, you th break that out every once in a while, if you need to like a little, little something to embarrass him, go ahead and ask him to see if he can do his golem. That's pretty good. And okay. um, yeah, he's, he's a, He's a busy man. He's got yeah. four kids now. He he, he loves basketball, um, huh. and cool. he's he's pretty passionate uh, about the game. So he even built a court in his yard um, so he can shoot hoops all night. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, we're glad to have you tonight. Um, every live stream, uh, Cameron, I always have people that want to talk about a solid acid, and. Uh, Wow, that's a subject that sometimes it's uh, easier for me to dodge than it is to uh, <laughs> try to get into it and then address it. Me and too. you and I, you and I have talked about it before and had good conversation about acetic acid. And and uh, you know your your focus is on tox toxicology, so you're studying all kind of things like that specifically how OA would work and research on uh, OA acetic acid. And uh, mm -hmm. so I thought it'd be nice this evening for us just to um, talk about anything we want to, but we'll, we've got to talk about oxalic acid because you are the Superman, the hero <laughs> of oxalic acid research and knowledge. So, wow. If, if anybody has a question, uh, Cameron has an answer on OA tonight. So, uh, mm -hmm. you can be getting your questions ready to sock it to him. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You, you sure can. I will do my best to answer any questions that we have. There's, there's still a lot of things that we don't know. Um, but I mean, I can I can start us off and, and talk a little bit about it. And just the fact that just so everybody that's listening can be a little bit up to speed because some yeah. people might not be too familiar. So so oxalic acid actually, you know, is is a natural compound that's in a lot of the foods that we eat. Um, and a lot of vegetables like broccoli is is chocked full with oxalic acid. But, you know, as as the old saying goes is it's the do it's the dose that makes the poison right yeah, so right you know water can be toxic if you just kept drinking water over and over right yeah. and so it's all about the dose so if you take something like this and you concentrate it so oxalic acid concentrated actually can be a pr it's a pretty strong acid and so um you know, it's it's fine when dosed properly, or properly, but then when when used improperly, it can it can hurt bees. But then also, as you know, as the applicators, us as beekeepers, it's good to uh, keep yourself protected by um, you know making sure that you're covering up your skin. If it gets on your skin, it can burn. It can get in your eyes. It can get in if you're vaporizing, which means you're turning into a gas and you breathe it in it's going to mm -hmm. hurt your lungs. So all these things, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm starting out with kind of the negative because uh, I mean, I just want people to, to realize it is something you got to be careful with, but I think it can be a really effective tool when you use it properly. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you said broccoli, and you know, every time that I uh, mention that you find it in 
like spinach leaves or rhubarb leaves and you know people like oh good i'll just put rhubarb in my smoker yeah. and i'll i'll burn rhubarb that'll kill all the mites off doesn't quite work that way does it we're no, not going to be able to grind up broccoli and put broccoli in a hive people <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I heard that a lot when hop guard was coming out and like, oh, the active ingredient is hops. Like I heard it's embarrassing to even say this twice. Two people came and volunteered that information that they poured beer into their hives. Yeah. They thought that it would work. And I was like, oh, that's a really, really bad idea. That's not how it works. It seems like if somebody pours beer in their hives, it would be an accident. You know what I mean? That's like, right. whoops, one too many. And I just drop my beer in my hive or something. But <laughs> yeah, there's a concentration of OA that really makes it potent. But uh, so let me ask you, let me throw some questions that I have for you. Um, what are the benefits and potential drawbacks of um, using osolic acid compared to other treatment methods that we have? Yeah, sure. I'll start with some of the benefits. I mean, the benefits being that, um, you know, we have a lot, we have some different chemical treatments, right? Um, some of the main ones that have been used the longest are like such as uh, ape, the product like Apistan or the Checkmite or even now Apivar. You know, a lot of these products that kind of were overused and abused have kind of have lost their efficacy due to mites developing resistance. So far, there are no reports of of any mite resistance to oxalic acid. Now, some people, I hear people say that they can't become resistant to that. And I don't think that's true at all. So we do need to be judicious, right? We, we should be rotating with some different treatment options. Basically, anytime there's enough pressure on an organism, you know, you're selecting for some mites that could be resistant to oxalic acid. So, so I guess the benefit right now is that there is no resistance. Um, the, I mean, a benefit is that well, from what we've seen after multiple applications, you you can kill a lot of mites and drop a lot of mites, which is ultimately what we're what we're shooting for. That's our goal. Um, I guess the downside, I kind of already mentioned that it can be hard on you. It can be hard on your bees. But, you know, I think I've heard kind of mixed reports on that. I personally have not really seen a lot of damage done to bees. And I've looked, I mean, we've, I've been mostly looking at the larger scale, whereas like uh, there's a researcher in Canada, Medhat Nasser, I mean, some of you have definitely heard his name before. Um, yeah. He looked a lot at this, uh, you know, years ago and kind of saw, yeah, it looks like there's some damage to their mandibles when it's mixed in a sugar syrup and they're touching it or damage to their, to their antennae or maybe like there's damage to the larva and all of that could very well be true. Um, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. but when you look at the colony as an animal, right, the whole, the whole animal, um, the damage does not appear to be super, you know, evident. And I've used some pretty high doses and I'm certainly, I, I'm not advocating for people to just go, go crazy and, and pour oxalic acid all over in their colonies. Right. But, um, but you know, I, I've not really seen that same kind of damage at the colony level and they seem to do pretty well. So benefits is it works with no resistance negatives that it can be hard on your bees. It can be hard on you. Yeah. And you know, the beekeeping industry has really pursued osolic acid with a lot of different kind of vaporizers uh just I, i've i've watched that really expand into all different kind of products different ways battery powered and and so i just want to talk about uh you know some of the tough questions that it's um quite controversial i think <laughs> when it comes to oa you know there, it's been it's been used in different ways and some of those are not the appropriate or really the ways that it's intended to be used like putting it on shop rags you know we uh, that that's an that's not something it, it was allowed in some states uh but then that kind of got uh pulled back in uh last year but uh of course it's a dosage that i think really comes into play here because i've heard and maybe from you that it seems like at the current legal dosage it doesn't have as much efficacy as it would at a higher dosage is that right yeah uh the label 
needs to be changed. Um, I've been saying this for years, so I'm sure people are waiting for some change because yeah. we've been working with the, uh, well, it was the EPA uh, to get that label changed. Uh, it's in the works. We have regular conversations. It's hmm. kind of getting held up. It kind of depends on which route you go. So if we're, if there's a current legal registered product like apobioxal is registered in the United States as acetic acid treatment, um, but that label has not been able to be amended. So actually when I, when I was at, uh, when we were in Kentucky at the North American Honeybee Expo, then there was somebody else, um, his name's Mike, and he was selling Easy Ox tablets. He got that legally registered, but he was able to register it at two grams per brood chamber, which is an improvement. I mean, that's a step in the right direction. So it's almost a little bit easier to register a new product than it has oh, been for us to change a label of a product that already exists. I see. So I think it's, it's happening. Um, it will happen and it will uh, be okay. It's just, in my opinion, not happening fast enough. I, I want, I want beekeepers to have some legal options, right? Yeah. And, right. Um, but well, what is what what is the dosage that you have found, you know, per deep box? I guess that seems to be the perfect dosage. So it kind of depends on what which way you're applying that, right? So if if we are applying um, oxalic acid as a, like a dribble or like mix it into a liquid, and then you're you're kind of dribbling it on the bees, I've actually uh, found that the uh, we have a paper that we just published on this so other people can can check it out sometime um this the the current legal limit for that uh, is actually quite effective um and and that ends up being around like 2.9 percent oxalic acid you're mixing like 35 grams of oxalic acid in one liter of sugar syrup and that act that actually has done a pretty good job after multiple applications um, usually like once a week for three or four weeks. Uh, we also, um, I have found that I, I think that vapor is better than the dribble. Um, when you're, you're heating up the oxalic acid, it's, it's vaporizing gets in and basically fumigating inside. Yeah, right. Um, now that's where I've done a little bit more work just because I think at the time a few years ago, there just wasn't a lot of research on that. So I wanted to kind of focus on that. Um, but they, you know, we, we just, we found that two to four grams was, a, you know, was a step up from, from one gram, four grams was better than two grams and killed more mites. Um, so that's kind of where I'm leaning, but we didn't really see like a lot of significant difference between two and four, but four killed more. It's, you know, this is kind of the nature of science and statistics, right? We have to use statistics to kind of show that our results, you know, we're, we are very confident in what we're seeing and it kind of has to do with all the numbers and the data that we're getting. But so sometimes we'll say things like, yeah, I think four grams is better than two, but statistically we didn't quite see the difference. So that's why, you know, at least for now, the EPA is probably leaning towards somewhere between two and four grams. Okay. So if, if four could be better, could six be better? Yeah, that's the question I always get. And that's, that's really kind of past four grams is, is at least at the moment, kind of the end of my knowledge. Um, okay. You, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> I have heard. So that, again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for this. I want to make sure people know No, that, neither but, am I. No. <laughs> but, but I've heard from lots of beekeepers that have used six or eight, you know, they're saying like, we didn't really see any negative effects. Again, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that's the right thing to do, but, but uh, you know, it, it seems like at a certain threshold, you're, you're killing a lot of mites. Um, and so far, you know, I, I haven't really heard anybody hitting that upper threshold. I do think that work needs to be done because it would be nice to put a limit somewhere and be like, hey, this is really too much. Um, I, yeah. I should have said this, too, as kind of one of the pros for oxalic acid. You know, I, I don't again, I don't think that we should just be dumping lots of oxalic acid. But the nice thing about it compared to something like Amitraz 
is that oxalic acid breaks down rapidly. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. It's it's water soluble. It it uh, can it can kind of disintegrate relatively quickly, and so that's that's a major plus for it. So Cameron, give us the uh, the understanding of how does oxalic acid, like when you vaporize hive with it, how does it actually kill mites and yet not harm the bees? Yeah, what does, it, what, does that, well, what does it do to the mites? Great question. And that's one of those questions that I can't quite answer straight is we haven't really been able to pinpoint at least at like a molecular level, like what is happening and, and what is causing that mite to, to die. Now there's some, some evidence like right, that, that when you vaporize, for instance, instantly your bees are going to start grooming themselves and grooming each other and just be going crazy right they yeah. they really don't they don't like that it, it's very irritating and so that is one uh, possible you know reason that they, it could be um effective you know more effective on the mites than it is on the bees because it's not killing the bees not necessarily hurting them so much but they're they're grooming themselves and the mites are falling off and others think that the mites could be falling off specifically because their feet are basically suction cups and yeah. so and so if they're grooming and they get this oxalic acid in their in their feet they can't really hold on they're coming off but that said i mean if i hold a mite down and put oxalic acid on it it will die so something is happening it is getting through you know the cuticle somehow it is uh, uh yeah it is doing something and and killing them but we just don't necessarily know exactly how it's happening yeah wow that's uh yeah so with a, a solic acid then um has there been studies where you would ever use it and then go closely and evaluate a honeybee to see if there's damage done to their hairs or anything in particular on the outside that might you might be able to visibly see yeah that's what i was kind of saying you know i haven't necessarily done that i've only looked really at the like colony level effects yeah, to see right. if there was like reduction in brood reduction in productivity or something and we don't see that but yeah um so med hat had done some of that work and in canada kind of really getting in looking years ago uh, mary and ellis at the university of nebraska had been doing some work like that they had looked specifically at, at bees and and like i said they they did find some um you know did find some like burned mandibles burned antennae like on really like high doses um so it looked like it it was physically too much you know on a straight yeah. shot straight to that but then again if i look back at the colony level and i'm applying four grams in one brood chamber you know we don't see a reduction of of bee population mm -hmm. um and over time we see an increase in bee population so seems like it's it's uh you know not it it wouldn't be hurting them enough to be causing high levels of call of bee mortality anyways. Yeah. And, you know, we have to think about what the mites are doing to them. Right. So, you know, if we can get rid yeah, of what's worse, yeah, it's a lot worse, right. They're drilling holes in them. So if we can, if we can continue to reduce the mites, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a positive thing in the hive. Well, um, I know that some people don't realize how dangerous and bad mites are on a colony. Uh, and sometimes it's one of those things where if you don't see it, it's not real visible. It doesn't seem to be that big of a thing that we have to worry about. But in reality, it's very hard on a hive to go through this uh, mite infestation. And oftentimes their problem is that they're uh, transmitting and sharing viruses from bee to bee as they go around and bite the bees. Right. So it's when I, I remember about 10 or 15 years ago when I was doing a lot of teaching on beekeeping and we were trying to educate people on the viral destructor. Um, I really had a hard time back then and I thought it was, it was useless. I thought I, there's, n there's no way I can convince people that mites are a problem that they really need to do something, you know? Um, but nowadays it's easier. It's uh, <laughs> people have really started to understand it. I've really seen a shift. It's amazing. You know, when you, when you, I've been in beekeeping almost 30 years now and, uh, or it's, it's just amazing how do you see these shifts of, 
the perspective of especially new beginners. Now new beginners are much more um, concerned about how to con how to control uh, the viral mite. But uh, so that's a good thing. And we do have a lot more options with OA being one of many. I like what you said about swapping out our treatments because people don't, res you know, you think, well, how can a mite ever get resistant to being acid poured on them? Right. But, yeah. but they actually can develop, you know, over time, these techniques or ways to survive in the midst of that. So we yeah. are always at risk of any, any mites that survive our treatments. Those are the ones I think I worry about, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, what happens is you're, you're applying a treatment, like putting some kind of a pressure. You might be killing lots, thousands of mites, right? Most of the mites are dying, but there's a few mites that for either their behavior is a little bit different or, you know, maybe their cuticle is a little bit stronger or right. you know, there, there could be so many physiological or behavioral differences yeah. that allow for you're basically selecting for that population. Only those mites are the ones who survive. And so now they reproduce, keep reproducing. And they are the ones who, um, you know, the, those genetics now prevail. And, and so that's why they are resistant. So yeah, exactly. it, it, and it, with Varroa, reproduction and the way that they reproduce it can happen pretty quick you yeah can develop. So, so that's that's always the tricky thing and so that's why i i kind of shudder when people are telling me that they only use one product or the other i'm like yeah well you should think about that it's not just your population that i mean it could your population could be the start of some more resistance but then those those genetics will eventually make their way if enough people are, are yeah. really pushing hard on one thing Here's an here's another tough uh, question, perspective and beekeeping that I hear. I wouldn't say a lot, but I hear it, you know, enough. And that is, we made a big mistake when mites came into the country. We should have left them alone. We should have let the bees just work it out. We shouldn't have treated anything. We should leave our bees alone. If we do that, then the bees would have developed ability to cope with mites. But now by taking mites out, they never can develop their own way of dealing with mites. So we're just always in this kind of this pharmaceutical has us over the fire. Now we have to keep buying these products. We should have left it alone and we wouldn't have to be doing this. What's your take on that? Yeah. Um, so I totally, I totally understand that argument. I just respectfully disagree. <laughs> yeah. So here's what, this is what I, I would say, um, Dave, is that, you know, if you think of like honeybees as livestock, let's compare them to like cows, right? If, if there was a, you know, a parasite that comes in as feeding on cows, killing lots of cows, and we just decided let's not treat any of our cows. Let's just let the ones all die that are going to die and then let's, and then we'll, you know, just have these breed of super cows, right? Well, probably what's going to happen. Well, first of all, you're going to kill lots and lots of animals, which I feel like as stewards of these animals, like, I mean, feel responsible. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think the public would be okay, you know, with, with uh, millions of cow deaths, right? Like I also don't, I feel like a responsibility I, we all do as beekeepers, you know, we, we want to keep our bees healthy that mm -hmm. they're at this point over hundreds, thousands of years of coexistence with humans, right? Like, I mean, they're, they're pretty much domesticated animals at this point. Now, if we let them kind of just tough it out, we, uh, all these bees die. We, we probably will have a bee that, can kind of handle it, but I, I can almost guarantee you it would not be a bee that we recognize. So I'm, I mean, they have essentially, they've done this. There's a, there's a Gotland bee experiment um, where they put, uh, they took like a hundred colonies, they stuck them on an island, um, Gotland Island near Sweden. And then they, they basically let them go, right? Like they just, let them the ones that are going to die are going to die and then they did and almost all of them died after a couple of years but then after a, a few more years the bees started coming back and there was you know more bees on the island well you go back into those colonies and and they're not the same kind of bees anymore they're not the bees that we like they're basically what 
they do is behave very much like, uh, you know, like African honeybee colonies that like they tend to abscond a lot. They, they swarm a lot. So they're constantly leaving behind brood and, and going. Um, they're also mean and, and angry and they're not focused on honey production. Right. So my point is, is if we want, I, I don't think we can, just say we're gonna let live and let die let them all die and then the ones that live are great now i i think there's a place for selective breeding so actually breeding for bees that do this better than others like you're looking for particular traits where they keep varroa populations down i've got no problem with that in fact i strongly encourage that that's mm -hmm. wonderful we, we should be doing some selective breeding but i i just don't really buy into that concept of of letting them just die and work it out themselves again it's not that they couldn't it's that we wouldn't i don't feel like we would really like the result at the end of the day. yeah and and also like you said we're gonna we would have to lose so many colonies uh similar uh to when they first came into our country how many you know bee deaths there were then mm -hmm. but then um Bee, bees play such an important role in pollination and agriculture today that it would just be crippling to have a devastation just kill all the bees off while we slowly rebuild back. Right. Um, those things are just, you, it seems like there's easy solutions when you're just sitting around daydreaming about how to solve this problem. But then when you face the realities of how it affects ecology and all and it's just it's mind blowing what the repercussions could be so harmful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's see, uh, Jessica, why don't you throw us up some questions? Let's see what our audience wants to ask, uh, probably dying to ask. So thank you, Brian, for your donation tonight. He says, how long after you do five rounds of treatments of OA, do you have to wait before you do another round of treatment? Yeah. Great question, Brian. So my answer to that is maybe one that, not everybody wants to hear because we we don't like doing it, but this is why monitoring is so important. You actually need to know what your mite populations are. Yeah. Um, so whether that is like an alcohol wash, which is what I prefer. Some people will do like powder sugar shakes, which is not as great in my opinion, but it's better than nothing. It gives you, you know, mm -hmm. at least ballpark of what your mite levels are. That's when you need to know when you should be trying it again. I think a lot of people, push back against monitoring because they're like, oh, Cameron, I, I already know I'm going to have to treat. Why would I, why would I look? Well, just based on my experience and all the work that we've done with all these different treatments is that just because you spent a lot of money on a treatment does not necessarily mean that it worked. Right. Um, yeah. Just because you think you killed a lot of mites because you put it in there doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that it worked. Right. That so, you, so true. You need to go back and check. Right. And so you, you treat, let's say, Brian, you asked about five treatments. You you put in those five treatments. Great. Come back a month later and see where they're at, right? Yeah, and, right. and then you'll know if they're kind of at a low level. We usually, usually we set that bar at like three mites per hundred bees. It's a little bit arbitrary, kind of depends yeah. on different things based on your colony strength and your goals as a beekeeper and yeah. kind of the season. But, but, you know, if you're well below that, then you're probably okay. Give it another month. Check again. Um, give it a couple months, depending on, on how, where the, where that is. Right. So just the, the best thing you could do, I, I think what really separates good beekeepers from like bee havers is they, they usually know what, what their mite populations are. Yep. All right. Good. Good. How about another question? Let's see who else has one. What temperature should, temperature should my vaporizer be set at for treating my colonies? Good question, Sally. Actually, such a good question that we just got a decent grant to um, to explore that <laughs> because a lot of let's uh, I'm not endorsing anybody here, but let's just say you got yourself a nice like something like a ProVape 110 and you're that usually those presets are at about like 230 degrees Celsius. That's preset. Like that's just what it's going to be. You could have the temperature, you have the ability to kind of raise that or lower that, but that's kind of what most people are doing. And you know, that works, but what we don't really know, uh, we, we know that oxalic acid combusts at 
about you know 160 degrees Celsius and or sorry it usually vaporizes at about 160 degrees Celsius and some and you know some of the literature has shown that it actually starts combusting into other products at about 180 something degrees Celsius right so even when we are starting we're usually doing something above that combustion level um and so, you know, we know it works, we know it kills mites, um, but we don't really know if we were to bring that down significantly, it would probably take longer, mm -hmm. but does it actually provide uh, a better benefit? That's that's one of the things we want to explore. Yeah. All right. What are the temperature limitations for using OA? Like, you know, Formic Pro is a, a treatment that really has some pretty tight lows and highs. How about OA? Great question, Carol. So. The, the yeah the, i'm glad you mentioned that like formic acid and and thymol based treatments like they have really specific temperature mm -hmm. um, limits um oxalic acid doesn't have as those same types of limits i mean we've done it really really hot we've done it really really cold and either way you kind of have to do multiple applications but you can after mul repeated applications you can bring it down people will often say and i I see where they're coming from. I'm just not 100% convinced yet, but you know, that when it's really cold outside, the bees cluster up and there's a really tight cluster and yeah. whether you're vaporizing or dribbling, you're not really reaching very many bees. My thing is that I don't know how you really know that unless you are taking really good mite counts because you're might, you might be like taking mite like measuring mite counts in the winter and be like, well, you got like 30 mites after one treatment versus the summer. Wow. We got like 300. That doesn't necessarily mean that there was less. It could just mean that there wasn't as high of a mite population during that time. So I think it would be actually kind of a difficult study to, to get at that mm -hmm. question um, yeah. or that specifically, but to answer your question simply, Carol, there's not, not really that many temperature uh, restrictions. Yeah, you just want to, to make sure that you're being careful with it. Right? Yeah. How about this one here? What What are your thoughts of uh, placing rhubarb leaves on top of the frames? I know someone that does this. He does not treat, and his bees do well. There's our answer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> rhubarb. Yeah. So rhubarb, just like you were saying at the beginning, Dave, like it has oxalic acid, but I don't think there's really any evidence that that would do anything. Um, there's there's possibly lots of other reasons that his bees are doing well tony is what i think so you know it's it's possible that maybe there would be a slight effect but i i truly doubt it you know those in order for the mite to come into contact that bee would have to like eat rhubarb and like rub it on themselves right it wouldn't doesn't it wouldn't really make sense to me i think more Really, probably what's happening is he just has some some good bees. Uh, maybe he's in an area that he's fairly isolated with not a, a lot of mites or maybe low um, threshold for viruses. You know, really, that's that's the key. I, I should have said that earlier. Is like really the issue here is virus levels, um, mm. particularly deformed wing viruses, particularly nasty. But there's our honeybee colonies are filled with viruses, um, and so. It's not so much that the varroa the varroa is the bad guy in the sense that it is transmitting and vectoring yeah. these viruses but it's not necessarily that's what's killing so th there could be lots of reasons those bees are doing well and i would be pretty doubtful that it's, it has much to do with the rhubarb or he could have this special type of rhubarb maybe and that's why wow. science is so great like i know. You don't want to shoot anybody down right like you that's can right. be a scientist you just have to collect the data i've I don't yeah. know if you've heard this before, Dave. It's one of my favorite sayings is, in God we trust, all others need to bring data, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, if you got something that seems to work, Tony, you got that friend that's putting rhubarb leaves on them. If they can collect some data, make their mic counts before or after, then they would be able to convince me, right? <laughs> yeah, they'd have to do a control study and uh, just see what they could come up with. Yeah. Why can't Honey Super stay on when vaporizing with OA? Well, I got some good news for you, Carol. They, uh, the, that was one part of the label that was amended. Um, and so you can uh, treat 
um, oxal with oxalic acid with your honey supers on, which is really nice to have that tool um, because the OA, basically, like, as I said, there's a lot of oxalic acid in the foods that we, we do see it sometimes, you know, dissolve into the honey. Um, but it's usually so far the FDA has decided that it's not ever at, been detected at a level that they're particularly concerned about for mm -hmm. human consumption yeah. well below then well below that level. So that part of the, the, uh, label has been changed. So so you you can use it with honey super song yeah, there you go heard it first here wow oh. <laughs> all right let's take uh, two or three more questions uh what type of stock are you guys using in the lab for these studies great question houston so it uh, i will just start off by saying it depends on our research question right like right now we're we're studying different stocks and so we have um over uh, i don't know probably about 80 colonies with different different uh, of like six different queen stocks that we're, we're playing with and, and measuring. Um, but most of the time we're using just a, a Florida mutt bee. They're probably mostly, you know, a lot of Italian genetics, but they're, they're all over the place. And, and, and so we try in most of our experiments, we use a generic bee unless we're answering a specific question related to like, russian queen bees or, or russian or new Orleans carniolans or pole lines or something right like if we've got a specific stock in mind then we will use it but most of the time we've just got regular old there you go florida mutts yep are the yard fogger treatments as effective as a vaporizer vaporizer yeah, treatments? great question mike i'm so glad somebody asked that so i actually after a few years of getting asked that question i finally have a good answer and the answer is unequivocally no i butchered that word unequivocally there we go no <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> it really doesn't work particularly well um in fact it didn't work at all we wow. that so that is a paper that is published now it came out in december um ugh, i'd have to i'd have to do some quick thinking to to remember what that paper was called but it's like called oxalic acid recommendations something it's in um, the journal of insect science um it's it's an open source journal where you can you can find it um oh Good thing I looked because I just I found it. So it's called oxalic acid application method and treatment intervals for reduction of varroa destructor populations in Apis mellifera. That sounds a little cumbersome. So oxalic acid application method. You type that in, look in Journal of Insect Science, you'll find it um, where we tested Fogger head to head with a dribble and vapor, and Fogger was by far the worst. Yeah, there you go. All right. How about another question for us? Is OAB heavier than air? Should we vaporize from the top down? Good question. So I can, I like, I like what you're, I like what you're getting We have some very smart, about. we have, we have some sharp people here. You Cameron, some, the, the Beak no Squad. Doubt. I mean, wow, they're sharp people. I'll tell you. Sharp. That. Yeah, no doubt about it. So, yeah. so to answer your question, you know, oxalic acid yeah it's uh, the molecule together is going to it's going to come down the thing is is when we are vaporizing it we are heating uh, this is important to note i guess is that um when we treat we say oxalic acid but most time um, i mean in, in the united states we're almost entirely always using oxalic acid dihydrate which means there's water in there and when you are heating water, water is going to, you know, be the one that really vaporizes, lifts that oxalic acid in the air, and then it's going to come down. So whether you are treating from the top, if you're treating from the top, it's still going to rise. It's going to come out. It's just going to rise and then swirl around. If you treat from the bottom, it's going to rise and it's going to swirl around. I don't know that it would make any difference, but mm -hmm. I like where the head's at because, you know, it is going to trickle down, but whether it was from the bottom or the top, it's going to swirl. I, and I'm saying that in like in a single deep, you know, if you had yeah. double deeps, you know, it's still probably going to reach that top and it, it's going to do kind of bigger. But if you kept stacking boxes, you know, eventually you would probably not be reaching the full volume. of it. Yeah. Right. right. Good question. Yeah. 
Who was the first person to use OA vaporization as a treatment for rural mites on honeybees? Yeah, Carmine, great question. And I have never been asked that question, I don't think, but I have thought of this question a lot. <laughs> Just like, who's, whose idea was this? Just, well, hey, we got this acid. It's, yeah. hmm, let's see what it does. No, um, so I don't really know the answer. I do know that... Um, it has been used since the 80s in Europe, um, in Italy, like there's some papers in Austria, I found some papers uh, from like the 80s where they were using it. I don't recall if anybody had said, uh, said this is the one, but yeah, it's been used for decades, yeah. primarily in Europe. Wow. How about this one? I'm gonna throw one up here, Jessica, I saw. Oh, uh, where'd it go? Here it is. What would you do? Uh, would you do a treatment in the north in the winter on 50 degree days? That's Fahrenheit. You know, warms up to 50. Would you do it then? Yeah, Tim, I would. Um, if I needed to treat, um, winter is a great time to do it because you've got uh, low brood. And if you've got low to no brood, that means there are more mites on the bodies of the bees. That means those mites are accessible and they're targets. So I think that would be a great time to do it. 50 while cold outside is probably not so cold that the bees are like really close together. I think, I think the conditions are, are favorable for yeah. a nice OA treatment at that point. Yeah. Good. And while we're uh, answering questions, Cameron, we're going to give away a book uh, good. Uh, tonight. It's called honey bee health talks about mites in here. Uh, this is by my friend and you know him too, John yeah. Zavishlock. So this is from the University of Arkansas. Nice little booklet. Talks all about, got good graphic. If you're wondering about what the diseases look like that you're struggling with, there you go. So we'll give this book away. And so what we'll do is we'll throw up hashtag health. If you leave that in the comments, we'll start collecting these comments. It's hashtag health, all lowercase, all one word. If you put that in there a hundred times, does not improve your odds of winning, <laughs> <laughs> but you got to spell it right all over case. You'll get a chance for us to send this book out to you. I really do like it. And uh, I know a lot of people have gotten the pocket edition of this, but look at that, man, some great graphics. There's a life cycle of a small high beetle. You got a small high beetle in Florida. Oh, we got our small high beetle. I know you do. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. Gosh. I had never really seen one until I moved to Florida because I've been like beekeeping in the West, right? Oh, yeah. Nevada and Oregon. Like, yeah, I had heard of it, obviously, but it, then I came to Florida. I was just blown away. I'm like, holy smokes, this is. Yeah, this, yeah. This I, I, you know, when I talk to you when we're speaking together, it's always great. And uh, I'm amazed at how much, how busy you are. Oh, my gosh. You're, you've just got 17 irons in the fire, Cameron, at the same time. Wow. And then you still find time to go out and speak everywhere. That's amazing. Yeah, well, I I told a group of beekeepers at the Honey Bee Expo earlier is like people ask me they're like, "Well, wh what's your hobby like outside of beekeeping? What's your hobby?" And it's like, "I don't know, like talking about bees." Like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of just become become my passion. I do have a few other hobbies by the way, but that's, you know, that yeah. is I I just I really enjoy it. I at the University of Florida, I don't technically have an extension appointment, so I don't technically have to do anything with beekeepers. I should, I teach students. I get paid to teach students. I get paid to uh, do research, but I don't get paid to go uh, to talk to beekeepers. So what I'm saying is, is at least not, you know, not from the university. So like oh. what what I'm wow. saying is like, I, I do it because I really enjoy it. And, yeah. and I got yeah. into this because I really wanted to, I, I became a scientist because I liked science and I'm a dork, but I, and I love bees. And so I was able to push this together. Right. Yeah. And yeah. find something that I really like doing. So, you know, we, 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 you and I've talked about this before and uh, sometimes, um, you know, beekeepers speak out of the goodness of their hearts. They'll go somewhere and, and, and give a talk and, and give up their own money and their own time. And this week I've, I've been, I think after all together this week, I would have given four talks, you know, so mm -hmm. I am almost hoarse tonight. I've got another talk. I've got another, another zoom meeting speaking to a B club out West somewhere at nine o'clock tonight, seven o'clock their time. Right. <laughs> I was but, just um, speaking to beekeepers, a uh, group of beekeepers in Australia four hours ago. Yeah. So it's yeah. just like I yeah. can do 
there's enough people talking and asking and so that we i mean you and i could we could talk bees all day yeah we can i really do think that people that give talks on on beekeeping if they go to clubs and most clubs are really good about covering contributing for the honorarium of speaking but i i think sometimes uh people don't realize for me personally i have to spend a lot of time preparing my talk yeah. You know, I may spend 20 to 40 hours if it's a new presentation I have to do research on. And then sometimes you you travel an hour or a day to get there. <laughs> and then you present on one day and then it takes you a day to get home. And it, oh, my gosh, it's just it's so much um, in any, any other business venture to do that for almost nothing but a free meal in a hotel. Other business people couldn't do that, couldn't afford to do that. And I don't know that uh, hopefully that people are realize that you guys are putting a lot of time and energy into your talks. Even tonight, I'm, you know, we're, people are making donations. I appreciate that because I'm paying you to be here tonight. And uh, mm -hmm. I think you're worthy of being paid yeah. to be here. I don't think anybody should be on a zoom meeting without being compensated. So well, I, I truly appreciate it. Like I said, I, I, this is it's something I enjoy. What you need to convince is, is my wife that's outside obviously she she loves what i do too and we we have a great time together but then you know it's hard i have four four little kids i can't be like on the road all the time without you know having some level of compensation <laughs> yeah I, yeah I, I, this is I, we're getting out of time i didn't mean to steer it in this direction but but i mean it is important it's like something that we love something that we do but oh yeah it's, no it's yeah, that's right. It, it is. It is hard on being away from home. Well, we got about uh, what 200 plus people wanting to get this book. So let's spin the wheel and see who's going to win tonight. There we go. Oh, that's always fun to watch all the names go by. It could be it could be you, Cameron. You could win this. I book. didn't put it in. Oh, put, Jane. Oh, there you go, Jane. <laughs> Congratulations, Jane. Good job tonight on winning. And if you'll just email us at uh, long lane honeybee farms at gmail.com, you will get your book. So congratulations to Jane. You'll be uh, so much smarter after diving into that uh, book <laughs> on bee health. That's great. Wow. I can't believe an hour has gone by so fast, Cameron. Wow. Well, Maybe it's it good maybe. times. You get me yeah. talking about bees and oxalic acid. Oh man, no. Oh. Yeah. We'll be here all night. <laughs> but we better not. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going out to Nevada again. And uh, I great. didn't see you on the on the roster out there. I was just so depressed. Oh, man. I know. I uh, the disinvite from no, I'm just kidding. I've, <laughs> I've got been able to go out there a couple times in the last few years. And so that's been great. Yeah. I've I've tried. I, since we, we, as we've established, we're both somewhat limited in what you can do, right? I've kind of tried to 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 spread it out a little bit. So yeah. some clubs, I mean, I'll go more than once, but I try not to do that too often. At least in the short term, I'd like to give it a few years so that I can give a chance to some other people yeah. because I just don't, I don't get a not able to do it all yeah, the time. Right. So. Did you did you speak at the conference uh, last fall in Iowa? Don't know the name of it. Big conference there. Um, no, I oh, didn't. Yeah. Jamie was in Iowa um, a while back, so that yeah. could have been him. Okay. Well, shoot, I'm speaking at that one, so I was hoping I'd catch uh, you there. Oh, we're gonna have to coordinate our schedule. What yeah, we do. Doing? We need to get back on track. But you know, it is overwhelming. I told Sherry uh, a couple of days ago, I love speaking and I love sharing with people. Don't get me wrong. I really do feed off that. It's just a hoot, but I don't know if I can physically do it. I mean, there's so many other irons that I'm, I'm trying to make videos. I'm trying to run live streams, you know, I'm trying to work my bees and it just takes a lot of work. I mean, I'm going to hit the road next Thursday. I won't be back until uh, six days later from speaking and, it's just that's a long time to be away, man. It is, and I've, I've this year I tried to keep spring open a little bit more because um, I'm I lead a study abroad in Thailand, and so we're heading to Thailand in in a few months in May, and so and that that one's a bit longer for me. So that's oh, like yeah. about two and a half weeks away and, yeah. or from the family, and yeah. then come back and I've got some stuff in the fall. So I was trying to keep the spring open as I could so that I, I, you know, didn't, wasn't gone too long. <laughs> yeah. It's never good when 
when Kelsey lines up the dates and looks at the calendar, she's like, actually, look at how many weeks you were gone this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We spoke together at North Carolina a, a year or two ago, and mm -hmm. I think you had your family there, didn't you? Kids yeah. all? When it's with when it's in driving distance, we try to to, yeah. to bring everybody if we can. It's it's great. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. I think it's one of the joys that I've had with with uh, having this job is because when I can take my kids, I usually take one at a time, and then we just have a little bit of one on one time together, and that's really yeah. great. And how many children do you have? I got four daughters. Oh, four daughters. Yeah, yeah trying yeah, for the son, or that's it. Nope. <laughs> that's <laughs> I know yeah. that's that's always the question. Like, well, are you gonna keep going? I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'm well, good. we'll revisit this in uh, yeah. two years. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're they're all good and sweet and tiny. Yeah. But, oh, I mean, okay. There's already lots of sass in our household, so uh, so it's only gonna get worse from here, I think. So. Do, do people ask you, are you going to raise, are your children showing interest in science and bees and all that? Do you get asked that question? I do. Yeah. Um, so part of that's, yeah, so my oldest is really into science and, and that's fun to have somebody else in this house that I can geek out with, but nobody is really into bees. Like, well, I'll take my kid with them and, and yeah. like, oh, do you go work bees with your dad? And they're like, no. <laughs> now sometimes they will every once in a while but they're never they're always grudging it a little yeah bit. yeah i know it's the same <laughs> you know we we have six children and of course we uh they were raised on a bee farm with bee work going on and they were a part of all of that you know they're out mm -hmm. there grafting queens they're working hives and everything and people ask me you know do your children are your children into bees are they are they i always tell this story my my middle son who was actively involved in you know beekeeping and everything at, at the bee farm and all to get away from it he joined the Marines <laughs> That's and how went bad. overseas and <laughs> fought in combat situations just to get out of the underneath his dad's <laughs> farm. That's what no, it's like, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, no, none of my children. I mean, my, my kids are interested. I shouldn't say they don't keep bees, but they're not interested in, in that level that I am. I kind of went crazy yeah. with it, you know. Well, yeah, that happens to us. All right. Well, Cameron, thanks a million for being here tonight, buddy. It's good to yeah. see you. And we, we will see each other on the road again and have that's a good time right. together. So that's right. Well, I appreciate it again letting me be here. I mean, great questions. I'm sorry yeah. we didn't get to everybody's questions, but I mean, um, really great. And and I appreciate, you know, all that you do and 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 communicating all yes. this good bee knowledge and and so keep up the good work yeah well thank you and how if people want to contact you or know more information about you where are they going to find you and what are you doing easiest way to find us is if you go to ufhoneybeelab.com yeah, uf honeybee lab that's all it is it's um and that's not again that's not just me i mean there's a team of us there like yeah, uh, you know Jamie's doing great research, and Jamie and Amy have their podcast, Two Bees in a Podcast. Yep, um, that is that's popular and and interesting. So I encourage yeah. some people to check that out. So there's there's lots of good information. We have put tons of beekeeping resources on that website. So definitely check it out if you can. All right, okay, Cameron. Right. I'll see you later. I'm gonna let you go. Bye. Okay. Have a good night. Take okay. Care. Bye bye. Well, thanks everybody for being here. I hope tonight was uh, really encouraging for you to learn a little bit more. I don't often bring in the experts because sometimes uh, people just want to share together and talk, but every now and again, it's good to bring in a scientist and hear some perspective of some questions that have been gathering together on the live stream. And I've been seeing a lot of OA questions. So it was fun just to take some and um, to be connected to Cameron and his work there at the University of Arkansas gives us a good uh, place to be as a beak squad because we have uh, somebody we can always fall back to me personally or even you and and uh, pursue more of these interests in treating our mites that's a big thing for sure um, so yeah I want to thank everybody for being here tonight wow you guys were great I want to encourage you to keep watching the videos please subscribe click on the bell. I really am working hard to make a lot of videos for you uh, guys to help strengthen your beekeeping uh, career, your hobby, your interest in bees. It's going to help you so much. And um, I see a lot of familiar names, faces, and words tonight. So, so nice to see all of you. So thanks for joining me. 
And uh, wow, we bumped up way over 400 of uh, you tonight, which is really good for this live stream. We haven't been on the on the air yet more than a year. We started last year, I think late February, or March or April. I can't remember. We're almost closing in on a year. So thank you guys. And as always, you're such an encouragement to me. You really do uh, keep me going. So I appreciate it. I love you guys all. You mean the world to me. And uh, we're going to let you go and hopefully see you really soon. And uh, take care of your bees. Look forward to spring coming. Thanks for being here tonight. Mm -hmm.